the objective of the PACE coaching, coach training was to train community service providers as parent coaches using a modified version of the Early Start Denver model, which I'll probably be referring to as ESDM. So I'm going to tell you about who we trained and how we trained them, and then Pat will continue and will also share with you what our partners had to say about the training. Who were the coaches? So 39 people started out at the beginning in the training portion, and they were all nominated by their respective child development centers or Aboriginal friendship centers. They had different levels of education and different roles at their agency. So there were infant development and Aboriginal infant development consultants, early childhood educators, speech language pathologists, occupational therapists, family support workers, behavior interventionists, and behavior consultants. A bit more about them. So you probably won't be surprised, but most of them, well actually in this case, all of them were women. On average, they were 54 years of age, and about one-third came from small, medium, and large population centers in the province, and they were approximately equally distributed across the three community sizes. There was some diversity in terms of cultural or ethnic identification and also languages spoken. So among the 44 people, 7% self-identified as First Nations or Métis, and about one in five, so 19% spoke English and one or more additional languages they all spoke English, 19% also spoke one or more additional languages. Most of them actually had quite a lot of experience already, about six to 10 years of average working either in early intervention or specifically with children with autism and working with families. 56%, so a bit more than half, had a diploma or a bachelor's degree. So these were our infant development consultants, early childhood educators, and the behavior interventionists who participated. And then 44%, so the rest, had graduate degrees, mostly speech language pathologists and occupational therapists. So we were interested to find out what motivated them to commit to participating in this project because it was actually quite a large commitment. So we asked them at the outset, and these are some samples of what they told us. So they did this in part for themselves, so for their own continued education. One example of a quote here, I just really see this as a huge opportunity for us to get some much needed skills and education. They also saw it as a benefit to families. One person said, you know, Children are part of a family, and if they learn the skills to help their children, then that's when we'll see the progress. Finally, some of them were motivated to do this to contribute to knowledge and advance evidence-based practice through research. As an example, to contribute to a knowledge base in a way that only strict research can, and to use this knowledge to advance our actual service delivery in our province. So, multiple reasons for people to participate. In order to be able to train the coaches, we needed trainers from BC who already knew how to do this. And we found them, thankfully, in Janet Harder, Michaela Jellin, and Mary McKenna. So we refer to these three people as our training facilitators, the training facilitators in the project. So all three are graduate level clinicians who were certified in ESDM as ESDM therapists, coaches, and trainers. They live in the province and had worked together previously to provide ESDM training for several years. So if we consider the coach training as a whole, it focused on content, structure, and process. So what do I mean by that? Well, the content is the curriculum. So 
what to target for children who are at risk of ASD based on evidence and specifically, as I've said, we use the Early Start Denver model. Then the structure is how to deliver that curriculum. And the process is mostly about the coaching skills. So how to work with families in this way. Formal coach training took place over many weeks and in two phases. So the first phase was about learning to use the page coaching model with toddlers. We refer that to that as PACE 1. And the second phase, which we call PACE 2, the tr in that phase, the trainees learn to use page coaching the PACE coaching model to coach parents. And each phase included, as you can see, oops, sorry about that. Each phase included, as you can see, a three-day workshop, so one here and one here, and an extended practice period. Before telling you more about PACE 1, I'm going to let one of the coaches, Karen Hanford, tell you about what, in her opinion, made this training unique. Karen is a speech-language pathologist with many years of experience in early intervention, and she works at the Queen Alexandra Center in Victoria. There were many things that were quite different about this professional development um, because it was intensive and it was hands-on and we really practiced all the skills that we were learning um, with real people. We had a, a child and a, a caregiver in the training portion and then we received as trainees the directed feedback on how to adjust our own behavior um, very specifically. So it was much less of a watch someone else do um, and that kind of thing. It was much more learning and practicing and greasing the wheels of how to become more comfortable both with the core skills of the ESDM format. And then after we practiced that for quite a while, then we got feedback on how to coach those skills with parents. So it was just, uh, it was intensive, it was challenging, and it was exciting too, to be challenged um, and watched and observed actually doing the skills that we were learning. And most professional development, which I like pretty much all professional development, but a lot of it is um, you don't get that chance to practice and then learn and refine what you're doing. So it was, uh, it was wonderful that way. All right, so I'm going to tell you more about the first phase, PACE 1, and then Pat will tell you about PACE 2. So in this first phase, there were three parts. There was an online introductory, introductory module, then the three-day workshop, and then, as I've said, an extended practice period that was about 12 weeks long. So the trainees learned about the content, the curriculum, and the structure for working with children within this approach. <coughs> Excuse me. So first I'm going to tell you more in these next few slides, and then I'm going to show you a couple of videos that will illustrate what I'm describing. The trainees first completed an introductory module, and this prepared them so that they were ready for the first three-day workshop. So we wanted everyone to have a common ground and understanding when they came to the workshops. So here you see a photo of Sally Rogers and Lori Vismara. They were both co-investigators in the PACE coaching project, and we consulted with them uh, when making these adaptations of the Early Start Denver model for community use, which is a very important feature of the project. It was a community-based project. Now a bit more about the tools that were used by the trainees in PACE 1. They had two companion resources. The first is a published guidebook called An Early Start for Your Child with Autism. This, the authors are Sally Rogers, Geraldine Dawson, and Lori Vismara. 
And this is based on the Early Start Denver model. It focuses on supporting the development and learning of at-risk children in everyday activities and routines. It's written for parents so that it's accessible, yet it's detailed and thorough. The second resource that trainees were given access to is a free web-based tool that's called Help is in Your Hands. And in these videos, there are illustrations of key components and strategies from the ESDM, as well as illustrations of parent coaching. Trainees also learn to use the CESDM curriculum checklist. C stands for community. So as the name implies, the checklist is about the curriculum or the content. So the developmental areas and the abilities that could be targets of intervention with the children. So I'm going to tell you a bit more about the domains or these areas of development that are included in the checklist. So there's receptive communication or comprehension. So uh, the child understanding early gestures and understanding speech words. Then there's expressive communication through gestures, through sounds, and through words, so vocal and verbal. There are other areas that have to do with social skills, social interaction, and that are also really uh, p key skills for to support development. So joint attention, which is the child uh, being able to attend to objects and people and to disengage from one to the other. So we, that's a very important skill. It's usually described as being triadic. So there's attention to, let's say, a play item and being able to also share that attention with whoever the child is playing with and go back and forth. Dyadic engagement, so back and forth reciprocal engagement with other people. And then imitation, as we heard earlier, is also very important. So imitating what they hear and what's going on and what people are doing in the environment. Then there's also a focus on thinking or cognition, activities such as matching and sorting, and play skills, so simple pretend play and functional play, so using objects in a functional way and to pretend. So as this should uh, hark back to what we talked about in the first presentation regarding development of social communication and these developments are interrelated and tend to support each other and to support the development of language. Within these domains, targets are individualized for each child and they're also going to change as the child develops and progresses. The checklist is used in three different ways. So the trainees use the checklist first as a, an assessment. So they needed to have a baseline, a start point, to know uh, what were the child's strengths and needs. Then the, the checklist also served as a guide for individualized treatment goals. Now, this was, these goals, as Pat described earlier, are set in collaboration and in consultation with the parents, so definitely with parental input. Even in PACE 1, where our coach trainees were working to use the strategies directly with the children. And the final way that the curriculum checklist was used was to, pro, to monitor progress, so to take data. We, to see what is changing in the child, so to know whether things are working. PACE 1 was about learning about content and structure to deliver the intervention, and the coaches learned to use key ESDM strategies to support social communicative development in toddlers. And they work with children who were already diagnosed in this phase where they were practicing both in the workshops and the 12 week practice period. And these children were not part of the research study. So in addition to the curriculum, what are these strategies that uh, they learned? So here are some examples of key strategies. One is positioning. So if you look at these photos, these caregivers and children 
are seeming to have very happy interactions together. But this is not ideal positioning if you were interacting with a child who is showing some social communication delays. It's important in such cases to really use position, positioning and to harness it to make it easier for the child to get the cues that are important and also for the adult to respond to them. So here you see that there's really a nice positioning that where the adult is in what in the, in the ESDM model is referred to as the child's cone of attention. So imagine a cone from the child's gaze and you want to be within that area. So what this does is it makes it easier to access cues and information that are part of the interaction and put them within reach. So facial expression, gestures, gaze. It's easier for the child to both send and receive this nonverbal communication. It also supports interaction with the adult and engagement between the two parties, the child and the adult, and joint attention. Another strategy is environmental arrangement. So really here, what we're trying to do is we're trying to minimize interference and distractions, as you saw in that first busy picture where there's too much going on. And we're trying to reduce visual and auditory distractions, so any noise from the environment, and have something that's more like this, where everything is in its place and there's less, uh, fewer things in the room. So we're trying to el eliminate anything that can be competition for the child's attention, other than the toys that are in the current activity and the person with, with, with whom they're engaging. Another key strategy is to follow the child's lead. Now this is sometimes misunderstood. So of course the adult is still in charge and needs to be because we want the adult to provide structure and to guide the child through activities to optimize child learning. This is still therapy. And also, of course, we want the child to be safe. So the, the adult is still definitely in charge, but we want to use the child's motivation and harness that. So how do we do that? So we try to enhance that motivation by using the child's interests, providing choices among toys and activities, a limited number of choices, but still, and adapting activities to accommodate sensory needs. So we're trying to, we want to be in tune with what the child is interested in, focusing on, and use that to our advantage in the intervention, in the interactions with the child. There's examples of how to do this in the Help is in Your Hands videos that I referred to earlier on and from which I'm going to show you a couple of clips very soon so you can learn more by going there. So some instructional strategies that are used will include modeling, so showing how to do something to the child or showing the child what is expected. It could be modeling a gesture, it could be modeling a word, it could be showing the child how to put a piece of the puzzle in place. Sometimes prompting if the child needs a little bit more help and sometimes imitating the child's actions and really providing what is called contingent reinforcement which is really about what they're doing and this reinforcement is within the activity. So, more examples in a minute. One last topic before we watch the videos. I want to introduce the idea of JARS, Joint Activity Routines. So, this is the context for the learning. So, the goals from the curriculum checklist and the strategies are embedded within these JARS, these activity routines. And these routines are natural routines that would happen in a child's life. The J, joint, means you need two people. And the AR means an activity. So it could be play with objects, social play, or caregiver routines. 
In terms of structure, jars should follow a four-part structure. The first thing is, the first step is the setup. So what are you going to be, what is the activity going to be about? Is it going to be a mealtime activity, a puzzle? Then you need to be thinking about how those objectives are going to be embedded within the activity and how it's going to be reciprocal and have some back and forthness and turn taking. That's the theme. Now, we don't want something that's rigid. We want a, an, ac an activity that supports continued expansion of the child's skills, repertoire, and learning. So we need to be adjusting it as, as the child develops and as we're moving along. And we need that flexibility to be built in. Finally, there needs to be a clear ending to this joint activity routine. So some clear signal that there, it's over and that we're going to be transitioning to something else. And this is very helpful and important for the children. All right, so now I'm going to show you two video examples from the Help is in Your Hands website. And in these examples, their parents are actually leading the joint activities. But I'm showing them here to illustrate how the goals would be embedded and some of the strategies that I've talked about. The first one is an object-based jar. Here goes. There you go. Good now, job. You may have a box for more. Okay. This is a good opportunity for him to ask for another or please, whichever you want. Okay. Horsey? Horsey? Good job. Good job. Put your hands in. Yeah. Good job. Yay. More. 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 Rose. Look at mom. Look. Good job. Kitty. Kitty, right here. Put the kitty right here. Put the kitty. Good job. More. You want more? Look. Good job. Bunny. Bunny. Where's the bunny go? Yeah. Good job. We lost the hound dog, didn't we? We don't know where the hound dog is. High five. Nice work. Good job. All done? Want to clean up? Clean up. So clean. In. Oh, in. Another one in. So I hope this um, illustrated how some of the goals that were embedded within this this play activity around a puzzle. So there were some thinking goals, uh, the child placing the puzzle pieces and matching them, but also some communication goals. And you can see some of the strategies at work here um, with the positioning and uh, also the coaches. Is, is, is encouraging the parent to ask for a little bit more from the child based on what they think that the child is able to do. Let's watch another example. So you don't always need uh, materials uh, or toys. This is an example of a sens sensory social jar. Get set, run, 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 oh, jump, jump, jump. Good job. You want to read a book? 
Or do you want to run? Run. Okay. That's clear. Ready? On your mark, it's a go! Run, 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 run. Run, 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 run. And jump. You did it. You did it. So this is another wonderful example. And you can see that they're really enjoying this activity together. And the child is loving running to the other room, but critically, he's waiting for the signal from the adult. So they're really in this together. This is definitely a joint activity. And there's some language involved, some listening, and some positioning, as you can see. All right, so just a few glimpses to help this come to life. So far, we've covered the curriculum and some strategies and the context for learning the JARS. So one more checklist now. This is another tool that the, that the trainees used and the trainers. It's called the therapist practice checklist. So the trainees use this to set up their intervention sessions and to self-evaluate. And then the trainers also were able to provide feedback using this form. So here the focus is on the coach using the, using the strategies. And there's, it's very small, so you'll just have to trust me. But what it says here is in the first, um, there's four different areas on the form. The first one is increasing attention. And some of the strategies involve positioning oneself within the spotlight, following child's choice. The second here area is increasing communication. So some strategies include waiting for verbal or nonverbal communication before responding and adding gestures in songs and play. And then the third area was creating the jars. So for instance, following that four part structure that I presented to you. And then the last part here called the ABCs, that's all about the goals, the supports, and the, the natural rewards for desired behaviors within the interactions. So this focuses on the curriculum and the structure. During the, the training, we wanted to support the coaches. And one way was to try to help them to develop a community of practice. So the coach trainees met online periodically with, in regional pods or groups with their trainer. And this was done through an online platform called Teleroom. They, they did this for various reasons, to provide mutual support, to share information about coaching strategies that had been effective, to brainstorm and troubleshoot when things weren't going as smoothly as one might hope, and certainly to celebrate progress. So these are just great photos of the coach trainees with their trainers that were taken at the workshops. And these are the various pods and the great names that they chose for them, such as five peas in a pod or the mountain pod. So while this was happening, we, at various intervals, uh, got information, uh, collected data and information from our coach trainees about how things were going. And we heard from many of our coaches that it was not always easy. However, mentorship and peer support seemed to be really key to, for them to be able to stick with it and for their eventual success. So let's hear now from two of our partners in the project, a trainer and a trainee. First up, this is Janet Harder. And she trained and mentored coaches in the project. Let's hear what she had to say. Um, there were a lot of tears from um, coaches in this because it was that hard. Um, it's emotionally difficult and it's very frustrating. And with, with that support, whether it's from the trainer, from the colleagues, I think that that is a critical piece in being able to go through this learning process and to come out the other side really changed in your practice. Let's hear now from one of our parent coaches. This is Georgina Exley 
from the Fraser Valley Child Development Center. Well, I have to tell you, um, the in-person um, training um, was probably the most difficult um, training I ever I ever experienced. Um, and um, but with that said, I also know there were when I can reflect back, um, there were many components that were amazing. Um, and as a new learner, I had pod meetings. I had access to a coaching trainer. I had my colleagues that I could debrief with because there were times when I was, I didn't know if I could push through because I am, I also have a master's degree in adult education. And one of the things we learned about transformation is that is one of the hardest things to do to transform your learning, to go from a totally different state and even question what you did before and your values and your beliefs. So it can be really challenging and we have to be supported when we're in what I call the muck, when we're in the middle of it, when it would be easy to turn around and go back to what we already know, but instead to persevere, um, to know what it could look like if we got to the other end. So as Paula explained to you in PACE 1, um, trainees were taught to use the core strategies with toddlers. Now, for some of them that was somewhat easy because th this was very similar to the kind of practice that they had been engaged in before training. But for many of the coaches, this was quite a different way of interacting even with children. And as you heard from Georgina, there were some real challenges. Um, we felt like it was important for them to learn how to use the strategies with toddlers before they tried to teach parents how to use the strategies with toddlers. And in fact, from the feedback we received from our trainees, um, we were absolutely correct about that. Um, the second phase was what we called page, PACE 2. And again, this began with a three-day workshop with the trainer. Um, and was followed by an extended practice period um, and also meetings in the pods that Paola already talked about. Um, PACE 2 really built on PACE 1. So as I've already said, um, our trainees told us uh, without PACE 1, we wouldn't have known what we were doing in PACE 2. So it really was, it built on, but it, then it diverged in a different direction um, than PACE 1, and again, this is where they learned to use the coaching model that they would ultimately use with parents in the um, research study. And I've introduced that coaching model to you already, this model from Hamp, Rush, and Sheldon, um, which is, uh, you know, this observation, action, reflective uh, feedback uh, kind of model. Um, so I'm not going to go into that in more detail, but good news. If you want more information about this, hot off the press is this book by our co-investigators, Sally Rogers and Lori Vismara, and their colleague, Geraldine Dawson, called Coaching Parents of Young Children with Autism. And in this book is instantiated many of the strategies that we taught the trainees during PACE 2. Um, so uh, Again, we've talked about what parent coaching is uh, in the previous presentation, but I want to bring back Mary McKenna now, who'll talk about the parent professional partnership that really forms the basis of the parent coaching experience. In parent coaching, the relationship is, is truly a partnership uh, between the parent coach and, and the parent. Uh, the coach comes with this knowledge in early intervention, they come with the knowledge about different strategies that have, have might work for those children. And um, they meet the parent uh, in the middle as a, as a partner, because the parent also comes with some experience and expertise. They know their child the best. Um, they know their daily routines better than anybody else. Um, and um, they also uh, have priorities in terms of, you know, what they would like to work on for their child, right? So they're motivated um, to participate in parent coaching because they want to see the changes in their child and they want to be a part of that. 
So as was the case with PACE 1, we provided a number of tools to the trainees uh, who were learning to become parent coaches. They again had access to the Help is in Your Hands modules, as did the practice parents with whom they worked. So each of the trainees had at least one practice parent at, in their, from their local agency who had a child who was already diagnosed with autism, maybe a little older than 36 months or around that age, and they practiced coaching with that parent. Um, and the, both the coach and the parent had access to the Help is in Your Hands modules, which became quite integral to the coaching experience. And they also had access to a series of what we refer to as refrigerator lists that built on the information um, in the Help is in Your Hands modules, and not surprisingly, were meant to be hung with magnets on the refrigerator at home to remind the parent, here's what we worked on this week, and here are some things that you can do to follow through. So really, the core of PACE 2 was to teach parents to initiate and conduct these joint action routines, the JARs. So parents were taught um, to design and conduct joint action routines in toy play activities, in social play activities, during caregiving routines, during family routines like book reading, um, during meal or snack time routines, and with some of the slightly older children, even with chore time routines. So the parent would typically, in a coaching session, identify a priority. I'd like to be able to go to the park with my child, or you know, we have a terrible time when we go to the grocery store, or bath time is a nightmare, or whatever, and I want to learn how to figure that out, how to engage in a good, positive social communication joint action routine in those settings, and then they would practice that um, uh, using that uh, coaching um, a diagram that I showed you before. So th that was really the focus of the parent coach training, teaching parents how to create and initiate JARs. Um, as was the case with PACE 1, the coaches received on ongoing feedback from their trainers, their training facilitators, and this time, um, oh, sorry, I skipped ahead. I shouldn't do that. My bad. Um, there was a structure to a parent coaching session. The parent coaching session um, had a chunk of time when the parent and the coach together would set the plan and share the plan. Then there was a big chunk of time when they would practice what it is that the parent had identified um, would be the focus of the session, and then there was a wrap-up. And for many of our coaches, um, this was challenging because they weren't used to structuring the time that they spent with families in this kind of way, but they came to appreciate the structure um, and the advantages of the structure over time. So um, I'm going to have you listen to Georgina Exley again. You've met her before, um, one of the parent coaches who talks here about the importance of the structure of parent coach training. Because of the complexity of our families, sometimes it's really hard to stay on uh, task and talk about, you know, why we originally were there. Um, and so I find that it allows us to get back into focus and work at least some of the time um, on what their goals are. Um, and then there's always time after to um, um, reflect on what is going on and how to support them in other areas. Because as you know, our families are extremely complicated between housing and food security and health and COVID and everything. So it's quite complicated. Our jobs have become um, quite complicated. But I also think coaching gives us sort of some structure and how to move forward and support families. Um, so during PACE 2, uh, parent, uh, the coaches continue to meet in their pods online. Here you see a screenshot of a pod meeting with Michaela and um, Georgina um, on the screen having a conversation about the most recent coaching session. Um, so that was ongoing uh, during PACE 2 as well. Um, by far, the most difficult lesson for coaches to learn during PACE 2 was to keep their hands off the kid to be blunt. 
In other words, not to model, because that's what everybody was used to doing, was model, parent would watch, now you try it. No. In parent coach training, there's very little modeling, if any, and that was the hardest lesson by far for coaches to learn, how to engage the family in the reflective practice that is at the core of um, parent coaching. The most important lesson um, that coach, coaches learn was that practice makes perfect that the more you do this, the, the easier it gets. And in the beginning, as you heard in previous videos, this was not easy for many of the coaches, and I'm gonna have you listen to a few more talk about that in just a second. Um, during PACE 2, the um, trainees continued to receive feedback from their training facilitators, uh, this time with a checklist that was even more extensive. This was a 40-item checklist that the uh, trainers would use periodically to provide training. Um, you know, it wasn't so much about what score did they get on the checklist as uh, a structured way of the training facilitators providing um, feedback to the coaches about things that they were really, really doing well and things that they still needed to work on. Um, so we're almost at the end of this session. I want, uh, um, I want to have you hear from two of the coaches again. Um, Alexis Van Newkirk, who's a speech-language pathologist, um, in this next video talks about the challenge of changing her behavior to accommodate a parent coaching stance. I came away from the training, funnily enough, just with greater empathy, I think, for what parents maybe go through when they are working on improving their own or trying to change their behaviors to, to help their child. Um, I, I think that it, there were moments in that training where, in, in the training where I um, I had, yeah, empathy for, for parents that, because going into the training, I, I had 15 years of experience working as an SLP and and yet I was being asked to change my behavior um, and to do, do things a little differently. And there, I had moments where I felt like, depending on, on, on what the dynamic was, but sort of like a little bit of resistance almost or, or, or frustration or um, probably all coming from this place of like, I don't know what I'm doing. This is just, this doesn't, isn't kind of my, I'm out of my comfort zone. And in this video, um, uh, Emily Moss uh, reflects on the difference between uh, pace coaching training and other types of training that she's received over the course of her career as an infant development consultant. I found the, the main difference for me in this training was it was the most hands-on training I've had. Um, having the, the training be where you're working with a family and you're getting that in the moment uh, feedback from your mentor. Um, that was the most valuable piece of it for me was um, you were able to make these adjustments in the moment and see the results uh, right away. And I found it was the easiest way to, to, to take it into my brain and keep, keep learning and adjusting the way I was doing it to make it what it was supposed to be. So I found it to be much more, much more hands-on, um, a little uncomfortable to have people kind of watching you and, and watching yourself through the videos and everything. Um, but I found, I found it so hugely beneficial to see myself and have the feedback of what I was doing and, and giving the suggestions and, and, you know, minor corrections and things to, to help me uh, improve my practice. And I really saw a huge improvement um, very quickly by putting those things into place. So, um, <laughs> I have to tell you that in the beginning, naively, in retrospect, we thought that PACE 1 and PACE 2 would pretty much do it for everyone, and then they'd be fully trained parent coaches. And we were wrong. Because um, after the formal coach training was completed, training really continued throughout the research study. Um, the trainees continued to meet online in their pods or um, when there was more than one trainee uh, at an agency locally, and the training facilitators continued to pr provide um, uh, some amount of ongoing mentorship. And this really proved to be an important component of the training and was endorsed by both the coaches and the leadership at the 
um, the CDCs or Aboriginal Friendship Centers um, where they were housed. So, you know, it, uh, we learned a lesson uh, about the uh, effectiveness of even an extended practice period with mentorship and that that for some coaches, many coaches in fact, um, may not be enough for them to feel really confident and fluid in a parent coaching model. Um, in the end, we trained 31 coaches from all over the province from Terrace to Cranbrook and from Fort St. John to Victoria and everywhere in between, most of whom went on to coach between one and three families each. Um, as you've already heard, uh, training was described as hard, sometimes humbling, but certainly worth it. And um, it required considerable local resources. So what I didn't tell you is that the project reimbursed the agencies for all of the coach time and expenses that was, that was devoted to the training. So this was not done on agency expense, this was done at project expense, um, which was important because we knew that agencies were financially strapped anyway and we didn't want to add to the burden by asking coaches to devote considerable time to this training without reimbursement. Both coaches and leadership uh, at the agencies um, described the training as facilitating a real paradigm shift in their agency in how they deliver services to families. And in this next video clip, Michaela Jellen reflects on this paradigm shift. You know, a lot of clinicians, they're really good at what they do. They're really good at getting a child to engage with them in a way that perhaps the parent isn't used to. And so then when they're watching a parent and a child and they think, oh, just do this and this and this and this and this and this and this, um, and the parent's sort of not at that ability level to, to jump in and do all of those things, it's really hard to just let go and pick the thing that's the most important in that moment and most relevant to that parent and, and take the time. Yeah, you know, been fortunate to maintain relationships with with many of the uh, coaches um, that I that I worked with in the project, and um, I would say those who were were willing to go through that paradigm shift from expert to coach, and they talked a lot about coaching changing their practice. So I, I haven't, Pal and I haven't. Um... Uh, shown you graphs and data, we have tons of it, we could have done that, uh, that was, that came out of the parent coach training phase. Um, we thought it would be more interesting for you to actually see what it looked like and hear from our coaches, but we do have data, for sure, and our data suggests that the PACE coaching model is likely a scalable model for parent coach training that is community-based, that was strongly endorsed by our partners, that is applicable to both infant development, early childhood consultants, and to graduate level clinicians, and that importantly includes strategies for evaluating quality and impact. We believe it's really important not just to institute a program, but to evaluate its quality and impact over time. So if you're interested in more information about the coach training data, feel free to reach out to us. We'd be happy to share that.